director here at Deutsches House at NYU. And uh, as always, I feel like Bill Murray in Round Top Day when I welcome you to this conference. <coughs> I feel like I've done this many times and I can't remember. But at least this awful song is not blaring that the poor man has to listen to when he wakes up in that hotel in Pennsylvania. Although it might wake us all up. Um, Having said that, it's a pleasure to welcome all the guests of the TELOS conference uh, for, in this case, your second day in the conference. I hope you had a wonderful uh, interaction yesterday, and I hope the uh, fruitful discussion and dialogue will continue here at Deutsches Haus uh, today and tomorrow here in the auditorium, and then for the breakout sessions later in the conference room. As always, I'm immensely grateful for the wonderful collaboration of Mary and for her colleagues. That's also a, a big stable uh, of the year. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces on stage, so to speak, and in the audience I also see some new faces, guests of Deutsches House, and of course all the registered guests from TVOS. And uh, the conference, um, of course, has, has another very unwieldy but uh, timely title, as you all know. And um, I guess given what is going on in the world and the role religion has been playing, it's uh, indeed a very, very worthy subject matter to explore in greater detail. As always, I like to remind people to silence their cell phones when they are at Deutsches House so that uh, people don't get interrupted by nasty ringtones. And uh, <laughs> uh, <Nice> <laughs> <laughs> they could be nice ones, and they're, they're less uh, <laughs> obnoxious, but it's still hard for the speakers to take. We just had this happening yesterday, well, so I, I was Here. just reminded. Yeah. Um, and this is pretty much it on my part. Uh, have a great time today. You can find me upstairs. If you need me, sometimes I'll be here. Um, but um, enjoy, and of course, now welcome the, the keynote speaker and Adrian, of course, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Juliana. Uh, as always, it's an enormous uh, pleasure to be here, and thank you for your hospitality. Um, it's, it's really uh, wonderful for us to, to be here again. I think this is now the sixth year. I've lost track. Uh, anyway, it, it's, uh, it, it does feel, on the one hand, like like Randall Days we said, but also every one of these conferences uh, you know, is different, so it's more like the, the non-identical repetition that Kierkegaard, I think, had in mind. Um, so, um, a very warm welcome to all of you, um, and you know, we, we will uh, we'll be here for, for the next day and a half. Um, I thought we had a great start yesterday, and thanks again to David for kicking us off with a very uh, inspiring paper, which I think generates a really lively discussion. Uh, not least because we had both keynote speakers on the panel yesterday, and they are in different ways the sort of fireworks that you you need and want at a conference to really um, generate that lively exchange of ideas that we want to have here in the next um, couple of days. We chose this topic of political theology really because um, it seems to be a time when a number of crises are all coming together. You could start off by saying there's a crisis of capitalism, of which we've heard probably more than enough over the last 10 years, but that then raises questions around perhaps you know, the crisis of the underlying uh, ideology and, and philosophy, perhaps you know, mostly in the West, that's of liberalism. And then in turn, you could say liberalism, whilst it had religious roots, has also become uh, secular, and so we might also mention the crisis of secularism. And clearly, all of the assumptions that have been made you know, since the 60s about secularization, the fact that modernization leads to the decline of religion, the fact that religion will become ever more private and perhaps disappear altogether. This has, of course, all been proven entirely wrong. Because just as that thesis was being uh, put forward by uh, sociologists and others who clearly hadn't read any history or philosophy, uh, so you know, we saw just the opposite happening in the real world. We saw, you know, 40 years ago, the Iranian Revolution. We saw all sorts of movements defeating communism uh, you know, around the world that were you know, often religiously inspired, as in Poland and elsewhere. But at the same time, of course, we've also seen that there has been a, a huge transformation in the way we think about 
uh, faith because, of course, religion isn't some kind of objective category out there that will capture any lived reality. Just the opposite. Religion is, of course, about lived communities, so there will be anthropology, there will be some science, and Wayne will remind of the importance of bringing science back into these conversations. But really, the crucial thing is that political theology is not something that's ever going to just go away. Uh, it's always going to be part of the way we think about politics, about society, about the economy, about our humanity and our relation to, to the cosmos. So whilst we may uh, not think that there's always much mileage in revisiting you know, past political theologies, whether that's of, of Schmidt or Patterson or, or any others, clearly the question of political theology uh, is uh, always going to be uh, you know, one of great um, importance and topicality. Um, and it gives me enormous pleasure to, uh, to welcome our first keynote uh, speaker this morning, uh, Professor uh, Wayne Hudson of Charleston University in Canberra in Australia, who's known to many, uh, if not all of you, um, who is a, an extraordinarily prolific uh, author. Uh, I think he's now got nearly 30 books to his name, but it may well be more already. Uh, he writes them every six months or so. Um, sometimes they are a long time in the making, um, but then they all come out, and, uh, and you do uh, wonder how this man can be writing, traveling, speaking, teaching, all at the same time. Um, you can tell I'm a fan, um, and I'm a fan because I think Wayne uh, never goes for easy answers. He always challenges the conventional categories. He always uh, raises the fundamental questions. Uh, and even if you don't agree with his proposed answers, I think the least uh, you can uh, say is that it's always very, very inspiring and uh, you know, it always gets us off to, to a fantastic start. And once again, you know, Wayne is true to his, um, to his own uh, outlook because he is not just uh, talking about any one aspect of political theology this morning. He is asking us to be rethinking political theology. That is the title of his of his talk. Uh, and so um, I think we're going to have uh, another uh, another fireworks in the next uh, half an hour or so. So do uh, do get ready. But we'll also have plenty of time after that for your questions, um, for your comments, perhaps for your objections. So do, uh, do keep them coming, uh, you know, there, there's going to be a lively debate, I'm sure. And even if uh, we will not be able to exhaust that until 10.15, there'll be plenty of other opportunities throughout the conference, okay? So do, um, do please uh, get involved. This is really what we're here for. So um, without much further ado, please join me in welcoming Wayne Hudson. I think Adrian was so accurate, I don't need to say anything at all, because you've got it all. Uh, what I'm going to do is a little bit, as Adrian is suggesting, and a little bit not, but mainly as he's suggesting, uh, I got very nervous about this address. Now, I can keynotes you know, all over the world, and I usually give them to technical audiences, which means, of course, that I read out boring text with lots of footnotes and lots of examples. And that's good, because people understand that genre. Uh, you're an expert in the field, you were boring, you were very thorough. <laughs> I'm in this mode a bit different because we don't have a discipline in common in this room. And um, we have a variety of languages that we are missing about eight of the languages we need. So I can't give you that kind of paper and rethink political theology at the same time. I've got so nervous about this address that it's turned into a book. The good news is we might have another book in the Telos series. Uh, we have now a book in draft. It's not very good, but it is in draft. I'm not going to read that book. I, I promise you also that. I'm going to give you a, a number of rather large thoughts about thinking political theology, uh, not sufficiently defined and not sufficiently justified. And I'm going to do it, I hope, in a way that will agitate you to formulate your views more clearly. So I don't seek agreement, Adrian knows that. I don't mind if you think everything I say is misconceived. In fact, I'll be very happy, I'll just ask you to send me more emails. Uh, I simply aim, in a way, uh, to stimulate your own thought. It's, a, it's an exercise in global education. Uh, what Adrian didn't tell you that I should tell you is unfortunately there are 12 way notes. The reason I can do all these things is that only one of them does each of them. But there are 12. And that does create problems because one of me is a microhistorian, and that person is a complete boring pedant. 
And that person is only interested in one word in an ancient document or one letter Hobbes wrote that's never been published or one reference somewhere in the Middle East to someone we've now forgotten. That's one. Another one is the lawyer. And if you were here last night, you would have heard my lawyer's side. And that I call vacuum cleaner way. And that I was trained in this in the law at the highest level in Australia. And I can read 25 cases in half an hour and give you the uh, main judgment and all the alternative judgments and summarize them and propose them to the prime minister. I did that for years. And for that reason, I can go to a library and read it over the weekend. Isn't a good scholarly approach, I'm sure you agree. But there's the lawyer. And then there's a third Wayne Hudson, uh, who's very, very different, and that's the utopian. And you're going to hear a lot of that today. And please notice that the utopian is not the micro-historian who's into the detail. And the utopian is certainly not the, the lawyer who really knows a lot about the actual world and how to change it. I've given lectures on governance to the high courts and governments of almost every Asian country, uh, including China. I gave lectures on human rights to the people writing all the laws of China. And when Ali Buiwen, who wrote the Chinese Constitution, came to Australia, I was the person to respond as the only person, obviously, who'd know about Chinese law. Of course, I knew nothing about Chinese law, but that didn't matter. So there are, there are a lot of Wayne Hudson's, and they don't fit together coherently entirely. And when you know one, you have to remember there's the other one. Because if I'm a utopian, you'll forget that I'm a realist. If I'm a realist, you'll forget that I'm a utopian, and so on and so on. So that is a bit, in a way, how I can do all these many strange things. It makes me strange, but I hope it makes me a little bit creative, because there are not many of me around. I now begin with rethinking political theology, and I thought it out with an eye to the telos line of a critical theory of the contemporary. And I'd like to know what uh, telos means by a critical theory of the contemporary, because I'd like to know what a critical theory is and what they mean by contemporary, and whether they think the contemporary is not non-contemporary, because obviously, if you think of Russia, if you think of India, it's not contemporary, you need it's non-contemporary, it's unglaschleidisch kind. Right? But I'm sure, as a German, we'll hear something back, back from that from April. Rethinking public theology is a huge issue, so I've broken it down into about four areas. I'm going to talk intensively only probably about one. The first one, which is very, very interesting, is a critical analytic of uh, political theology. So what I've done for this is that I've looked at all the political theology that's ever been in any language in any country in the world. And that's not normal, I'm sure you agree. And what have I found? Well, I've found, of course, that no one in the field has a good definition of political theology. There is no good definition anywhere. Uh, there are many definitions, but no good, powerful definition. Uh, I can give you four or five. For example, the study of how theological concepts relate to politics, society, law, ethics, and economics. That's lovely, except that it uses the word theological concepts. And first, you have to explain that there are theological concepts, and they don't do that. And the things they talk about are not concepts. Mm -hmm. Or a mode of inquiry that understands the modern period is incompletely secularized. Well, that's wonderful. Except that it uses the word modo, which is, of course, an irrational, as you'd understand. It can never be instanced because it's always past mode. Just now it's always over. And secular is a problem. I won't go through that, but you'll know your talent as that, I'm sure. You'll know for all the reasons why we can't distinguish religion and secular. And then there are uh, more. A third one would be, and this is a cleverer one, like people who've read Adorno, the irreducibly transcendental outside, which persists in the imminent historical medium. That's a sophisticated, complicated, clever definition. Again, it's a lot of fun, but it can't be given rational sense. Uh, the words are being used. Are high. This is very Adorno, it's very German. You take highbrow philosophical words and you, you use so many of them, no one dares question you, except someone trained in analytical philosophy like me. I didn't tell you another one of the Wayne Hudson's is an analytic philosophy person. I'm not really an analytic philosopher, but I've taught it for about 12 years in major world universities, and my students all become quite famous. So I know a lot about Frege. I know a lot about Oxford and Cambridge type analytic philosophy. I'm not an American analytic philosopher, but I do know a great deal about American analytic philosophy. And I certainly think that David Lewis is the greatest philosopher of the 20th century. And if you don't know why he's right about de necessity, then we can't talk. Okay. So uh, I've done a huge amount of reading for you. I've read everything. And I've asked how many political theologians are there. Well, on my count, there's about 150, unless you include indigenous. If you include indigenous, it goes to 3,000. Well, let's leave that out. Uh, there's also a problem about whether to include public theology, because public theologians hate political theology. Uh, but I think that's a fake. They are basically political theologians who are just in bad faith. If we add them into the story, we get about 150 to 200 political theologians. If you're mainly interested in three, you'll see my first major point. But this is a field that is in problem because it can't define its essential terms. 
it hasn't identified the other people writing in the field. It's a fairly serious mistake. And then it uses words like religious and secular, which are no longer in good standing. I will, I'm not, I'm not, don't think I need to discuss the religious one. Please come bring a book, raise your hand if you don't know about that. But there are several hundred books establishing that there are no religions, there's never been any religion, there's no Christianity, no Buddhism, no Hinduism. There are big fat books on all of that, and there have been for the last 50 years. If you still think there's religion, then you're also not reading the biological sciences and understanding that. So I've looked at all of them, and I've looked at most of the literature, and then I've raised the problem, well, what about the history of political theology, because that's interesting. And again, it's not easy, because you've got to look at the Eastern tradition, the Western tradition, and all the major cultures in the world. You can't possibly accept the idea that this was invented in ancient Greece. You must be joking. Have you never heard of Egypt? Have you never heard of Babylon? Do you not know about ancient China and ancient India? Well, of course you do. So the history of political theology stuff's a kind of bosh. I won't go into that, but I have gone through the whole of it, and it doesn't begin with M. Terentius Barrow. No, of course not. And it isn't about Spiros from Noza, my God, no. I mean, by the time he gets round, it's been around for about 4,000 years. I've done the history of it, I can answer questions on that. The literature is appalling in that area. Uh, so what have we learned so far? We're learning this is an area with weak definition. We're learning this is an area where people don't know 90% of the material in the field. The third thing is it's an area of weak concept formation. And that's extremely important. I'm not saying it should have strong concept formation. That's very important to see that. Because in practical discourses, we don't need strong concept formation. So I have no quarrel with its weakness at the level of concept formation. I just ask you to note that you couldn't then make certain claims. So the problem with political theologians is they make claims. You can only make a strong concept formation while using weak concept formation. That's a really serious muddle. And then I go into what's good about political theology, and I find eight or nine major things. I won't go through it because I think everyone in this room knows all that. I think you know why we need it. Uh, Adrian introduced that, David touched on it last night. I will mention just a couple of, of problems that I think is, are so endemic we should face them. A lot of political theologians think we can discuss the political as a separate realm or domain. Now that's a disastrous assumption, you see, because it buys out of the whole historical process, because it implies that things are just plopped out somehow and are found in Brazil and in southern Yemen and even in northern Queensland. Well, in a way they are, but you've got to obviously sort that out. And obviously political theology is an animal phenomenon, mainly found before the emergence of humans, and that is right, I think, then you have to have big ways of describing that. And if you apply the historical record, you can't talk as though there was government in the ancient world, or as though the, the polis was in any sense a polis in the Western sense in Greece. You can't talk as though there was sovereignty in half the societies in the 19th, 18th, or 17th century. Uh, it's all got to be historicized, it's all got to be contextualized. And when you do that, the assertion of a separate realm called the political uh, is not necessarily false, I'm not saying it's false, but it requires a great deal of argumentation and evidence, and none of that's in the literature. They presume what they do not show, and that's a fatal flaw as well. Taking all that together, you might become a bit pessimistic about political theology, but I'm going to cheer you up and say, no, 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 no. Uh, because in our evolutionary process, we have hard disciplines and weak disciplines, and we should be old enough all now to know that the weak disciplines are the most important. Yes, physics matters. Yes, maths and logic matter. I play with all those in different ways. But the most important discourses are the weak ones because they motivate human action and the structure of human societies. And so all the things I've said against political theology are not against it. They're just to get a clear sense of what sort of thing we're discussing. And if that's so, then I can now say that we do need political theology and it can help us in our present crisis. And I just want to make, and this is the second big point, um, we have to accept the fact that we need to think about the contemporary situation. And a major problem in all political social theory at the moment is that most people writing it don't know anything about that contemporary situation. And I wanted to say a couple of things about that to get you on your guard. Now, I don't know how much earth science systems theory you know, and I don't know whether you're reading the main articles every morning. I'm assuming, of course, you are, though I know you're not. But it's generally agreed by earth system sciences the earth has entered a new geological phase, and it's also agreed that it's quite likely that the earth may blow up or may turn back into its normal mode, which is violent and destructive. If that's so, then the historical process ends and we get on the spaceship and get out fast. We haven't got enough and we haven't made it. Uh, so that's part of our situation. It's very great. A second one, obviously, is the global crisis of capitalism, which isn't a crisis in a simple sense, but is very serious, because without capitalism, we won't go forward. And with the capitalism we've got, we're in trouble. 
So a new capitalism is an urgent matter. All right, the world's best economists all agree on that. They're all working on the next economics. But they're not getting there. Why are they not getting there? They've got the wrong maths. So in order to get the right maths, you have to get out of our maths and move to qualitative maths. Well, you can do that. It's not very difficult. But people who do economics can't do that because they're not very good at that maths. You need pure mathematicians for that, not the kind of person who does baby algebra in front of his undergraduates. I did economics and did baby algebra. I didn't write it anyway. Okay, so the contemporary situation is our term of reference. That means not the 1930s. And it means not uh, the war with Mexico. And it means not uh, some particular problem in the Baltic. No, no, no. It means the emergence of China as a dangerous superpower of enormous capacity that threatens not only to eclipse the United States, but to change the whole political logic of the world. And it's extremely important. It's very worrying. David and I have been there recently. It's very worrying. But we must not run away from it. And on this one, I have a little bit of sneaking sympathy, even for the dreadful Trump, because at least he sees some of the problem. Seeing no, nothing of the problem, why not? To put it all together, we need a new approach in a different situation. The next point, and it's another big point, well, that means we have to take what I'm going to call the post-historical term. The post-historical term. But this is, in detail, very technical, and I gave a major keynote about this to the intellectual historians of the world last year, because I can show you in detail why Renaissance theories of history are no good, and why we can't use Renaissance accounts of history. But I won't give that now, because you really need a lot of technical stuff for that. The point is that historical parameters of human life are passing away. Science and technology in advanced countries are increasingly changing the nature of human life and changing the nature of the environment such that the wisdom accumulated over the centuries is only partly applicable. The scientific shift is so vast, the technological reality is so enormous, that we would be wrong to assume that there will be human beings in the future. And we would be wrong to assume that the existing socio-political arrangements will survive. So a post-historical turn means that we take seriously the thesis that natural human beings may see, cease to exist. We take seriously the thesis that mechanized environments will replace natural ones. And we take seriously the very urgent thesis that the human brain's restructuring will be irreversible and will make traditional culture impossible. That's partly true now for young people in the United States. It's partly true for young people in Australia as well. So the post-historical turn is very, very serious. And it requires a response. And there's not a lot of response out there at the moment. I apologize for that, but there isn't. Well, my response is to argue for post-historical enlightenment. Here I must thank both Russell and David, because uh, I've been trying to write this for quite a long time. And some of the best criticism I've had in the world has come from David. And I'm very grateful for that, because my early drafts were really pretty shocking. Uh, they're still not good, but they're getting a bit better. Because what I'm trying to say is that we need enlightenment but not the Enlightenment of the 18th century. And that requires a lot of spelling out, but you get the point. I don't defend the old Enlightenment. I do insofar as it was right then, but it's not what we need now. And I don't defend Enlightenment in the sense of beliefs. Americans get rather keen on the idea that ideas are important in history. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I think Enlightenment's about institutions. And of course, again, we don't need just the 18th century ones. We need new Enlightenment institutions. So my Response to the situation is to argue for a new orientational framework. Orientational framework is a technical term. It's a wonderful book from London University last year by a wonderful lady called the Orientational Framework. And it picks up a lot of David's material about aestheticization because we'd like to have a hardcore framework for thinking about our reality. But one of the things political theology tells us that's really good is that you can't do it to crucial points. At crucial points, you have to wake up and say, I'm as hard as I can be when I can do it, but in the rest, I'll have to be soft. In other words, you need what's called an orientational framework. So I provide a new orientational framework. I won't go through that now because it is difficult and complex, but it gives you the flavor of a post-historical enlightenment that is not Eurocentric, that is not geodesic, that is not uh, exclusive of most of the people in the world, that is not uh, uh, reciting the pieties of white nationalism as global history. A post-historical enlightenment that engages with the contemporary sciences, they reward you about that, and which also engages with indigenous cultures in every country. And the two points are quite important because lots of people want to go scientific, but they don't want to go indigenous. Lots of people want to go indigenous, but not scientific. You have to do both, and they correct each other. 
And in the same way, if you want to do contemporary, you have to do anthropological. And you can't believe in, for example, modern economic theory. One should know about any society that didn't have modern economics, because, of course, it doesn't apply. There's no application of society. That's not here. So I then go into this post-historical enlightenment as an orientational framework that meets, if you like, the rationality gap to which post-political theology draws our attention draws our attention to it, my response is post-historical enlightenment as an orientational framework. Now, I'll just say one more bit about that, and then I'll go to the core of the presentation. Uh, in developing this historical, this orientation framework, I, as you would expect, I talk about differential naturalism. You've probably seen the book on that. I talk about differential uh, anthropology, about different sorts of human, humanization that will occur in the future. I talk about the confliction of politics. So although I'm a utopian, I'm not a utopian in politics. Please notice that point. Not a utopian in politics. Confliction of politics. First wave on that. Rocketty social thought that picks up Tocqueville and a good deal of what I think is great about America. I think this is the greatest country in the world, I don't think you're very good at knowing why you are so great. You're great because of your vocative character. And you don't remember it, and you've forgotten it, and it was once true in every country town. You need to bring it back, and you need to give it to the whole human race, because you're very good at it. And then I also talk about a new political economy based on a new mathematics, certainly. And then a legal thought, a new kind of legal thought, based on natural law, not scholastic natural law, of course, more in the Blockian sense of natural law as an emergence of of artificiality, which then provides a norm for justice. I don't buy the Derrida negative stuff. I buy the, the built for vote up to a point, but if it means you can't decide who should be shot and who should not, I don't buy it. And if you have a political system that elects people of a certain kind, I don't buy it. Uh, I don't buy it. And then finally, of course, post historical spirituality based on the distinction between cosmology and cosmosophy. Now, the last bit's heavy, but it's very important, and it was in, in many of the other presentations already. We need cosmology scientific, but we need cosmosophy, and cosmosophy can't be scientific. If we get clear about that, we stop trying to put our junk in the science. We also stop falling into nihilism because we know we need for cosmosophy. And cosmosophy can't come from the sciences, can't come from logic. It can come from mathematics. And just to warm you up, uh, there is a new phase in the history of theology at the moment. It will be in every newspaper within a year. It's the turn of mathematical theology. Because the best book for the last 50 years is on the history of Christian mathematical theology. And once you've read eight or nine mathematical theologies, you get the message. I got a long time ago, I didn't know about Christian stuff, I confess that, because I knew Albinus. Albinus wrote one of the great works about antiquity. It's about uh, the theology of mathematics. Because, of course, in the ancient Greek world, the gods are all numbers. All right, now that's a lot of stuff to take you to too quickly. And I've got one more dreadful bit before I start the substance, and then I'm nearly finished. I do go into what's wrong with the Enlightenment conception of religion. That's several chapters. And I also go into what's wrong with post-religion. I need the last bit, because otherwise you're going to go and buy books on critical theory by Columbia University Press, which is sort of running a junk version of post-religion. Post-religion was something invented maybe about 1850, and it's, it's alive still now. It's the idea you can get out of religion and do something else. Well, yes, of course, that's right in one way, but not in the post-religion way. So I denounce the whole of post-religion in about three chapters. Then I have to come to the point, well, where is all this stuff possibly leading? Well, it's leading, as I hope you'll be glad to know, uh, my pages have disappeared, oh, it's, it's coming. Uh, it leads, of course, to a, a utopian theology. Now, in order to talk about utopian theology, I have to uh, remove some obvious errors. We have to ask ourselves, what do you mean by theology? Well, you don't mean the science of God. Now, as I said last night, God's got nothing to do with theology and never did have anything to do with it. Uh, that's a complete disaster. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Jewish tradition. I can argue that for you if you want it in detail and give you all the books from the Hebrew University. Uh, and I've said quite a lot of people, if you are into Jewish thought, I'm very enthusiastic about Rabbi Cook. So if you know who Rabbi Cook was and what his role was, you'll see that I'm not undermining the Jewish tradition, but I'm insisting on a strict interpretation and not a slack one. Uh, so a new theology, not that definition. So what kind of definition? Well, I'm going to give you three, because I'm in favor of a fair bit of pluralism in this area. The first one is a critique of idolatry. That looks very Jewish, and I think it's absolutely right. Critique of idolatry. Wonderful definition of theology. Not junk about non-existent beings, absolutely not, but a critique of our idolatry. And I, I'll throw another point on the Jewish one because it's only fair to say that seeing I've been so favorable. I have trouble with aspects of Jewish cultural identity because I think Jews only do half of it. In the spiritual area, they get it, but in the political area, they don't because they don't see the group worship is another form of idolatry. Okay, second definition is, of course, the Orthodox Church participation in the uncreated life. 
And I like that very much. Remember, of course, the theory of agreement contemplates participation, not theory of agreement, which says. Then theology can be described as participation in the orthodox, in the uncreated light. And that leads you to ask your theologian, how much uncreated light can you see? And if you find in America, none of them see anything, well, I think that's a good result from the inquiry. The third definition, which is for atheists, agnostics, and other people who I think are completely right in what they say, but still asleep, completely right in what you say, but still asleep, the rational study of sentence. Third definition of theology, the rational study of sentence. That's a good one. Because honestly, you can be Buddhist, you can be Muslim, you can be agnostic, you can be just muddled, then you can still understand that we can rationally study sentience. But why would that have been well, because, and this is the bomb, isn't it? Once we get the religion junk out of our heads, we see that all sentient forms of life it's grip counterfactuality. It goes right down the evolutionary chain, certainly the plant level, maybe lower, maybe to very low levels. And then we have theology in the whole of nature because that stuff sentience involves. To be sentient, you need counterfactuality. When you have counterfactuality in your sentience, then somebody needs to understand that, and when you do it, you get the rational study of sentience and so theology. Well, that's enough to get the theology stuff moving in your mind. You won't be satisfied with what I said about that, but you'll see I'm not going to say stupid things, am I? Uh, I then want to go on to talk about the new utopian theology that could help Telos and help political theology. And I mentioned Telos because I thought what uh, Eugene said last night was very, very good. Kilos has made a great contribution to wake America out of its slumber, to draw attention to Schmidt, to insist on the need to look at hard thinkers and not weak thinkers. I couldn't be more on side on that one. But now is the time for some kind of more positive new initiative because America needs more help. It doesn't just need critical help, it needs constructive help. How do you fix the legal system in this country? How do you fix the voting system in this country? How do you fix the distribution of wealth in this country? How do you abolish the whole of the media in this country? I've never seen anything as horrible as American media. It's worse than Chinese media. It's worse than Soviet media. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. So I'm now going to talk about utopian theology and some technical theology in this, and Marcy will help you if, if, if you can't follow. Uh, and it is a bit dense, but I think you get the message. What I mean by utopian theology, then, is a fundamental practical theology. This is a technical term for theology, which gets rid of concern with neolithic beliefs and practices. I have no defense of neolithic beliefs and practices. They were very useful to us. I respect them greatly. But they're not the future. They're not the answer to the advocacy. No, they're not. But fundamental practical theology is the answer, because what does it do? It refocuses on the creation of new forms of recognition and new organizational forms. So it's after Zimmel. If you remember the sociology of Zimmel, it's after Zimmel. It doesn't talk prattle about whether there's one God of 39, whether the 4,000 angels are blue or whether they're black. It isn't into that. It says we need new forms of recognition. And that, of course, is central to the witness of Israel. And we need also new social organizational forms. Well, your church hasn't created many recently. And your synagogue, Black Lives, or your Buddhist temple, or your atheist club, not much. So new organizational forms are absolutely central to fundamental practical theology. Now, a little bit more, obviously, it has to be integrated with the natural sciences. It can't be based on superstition. But it can't be based on hard reason either. This is where I think political theology is really helpful. We have to make a certain space where we say soft is all we have that isn't very dangerous. You can put hard in the medieval church did that. You murder people. You can put hard in Islamic fundamentalists do that. They crucify. Uh, instead, we have to embrace our weakness. We go with Pascal on this one uh, and Chestov. Yes, we're weak and we can't do everything, and in some areas, weak is all we can do. I'm not with Batimo, but there's a touch of it. I guess it has a touch. So uh, we go to natural science, but we have to go also <coughs> in some areas in developing the new forms of recognition and the new social organization of forms. I have thousands of words on how to do that, and I apply it to all the concepts of Thought, democracy, sovereignty, citizenship, whatever you happen to be interested in. Yes, I've got a story about how to do that. Uh, and that's, I'm not going to do that today. But I'm just going to emphasize a couple more points, and then I'll suddenly stop. One is that in doing all of this, it's very important to see that everything I'm saying is not modernist, is not secularist, is not futurist. It's utopian, but not in the sense you know. It's got nothing to do with 20th century utopia. It's not block. Why? Because I don't think. Any future social form will be perfect, obviously. And I don't think dreaming of perfect future is healthy. I think it's pathologically ill. And I also think it misses the fact that we can do little utopian things now. 
And I also think that there's a deep metaphysical point there. I won't go on about it, but Adrian touched on it both last night and again today. Because if you reject voluntarism, you reject nominalism, you begin to understand what medievals meant by transcendence. I don't know whether Americans really know about the transcendence, but what they meant by transcendence essentially was that when you enter the universe with your full physical body, you find the divine reality. You find the divine reality when you enter the universe with your full body. Now, of course, body there's a trick word, I agree with that, but it's the medieval account of transcendence. <coughs> a couple more points, and we're nearly there. So if we have utopianism and no, uh, no futurism and no modernism, if it is, in my technical language, realistic non-existence utopianism, and the key word there is non-existence, that upsets Anglo-Saxons everywhere in the world, but that's because you've got a bad language. I mean, English is one of the worst languages there have ever been. There's no word for non-existence in English. You can't say X non-exists in English. Our language won't say that. Well, good languages do say that. Sanskrit and Chinese can say that. It's just dumb languages like barbarian languages that can't put French, German, English. Well, these are, are the barbarian dialects. Uh, we should go to the better languages or to new languages. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about that quickly. I know I'm running out of time, but I do need you to get this. Uh, inexist non-existence is crucial to what I say, because if you're interested in whether uh, divine reality exists or doesn't exist in the kind of village age <coughs> sense, you don't get anywhere. Because you've missed the main point. The divine reality in exists. Of course, no sensible person ever thought that the deus existed. Hansel got Thomas Aquinas. Well, I'll talk about Thomas for two hours if you like. I'll just give you one line on that, just to cover that one. Of course, Thomas is wonderful, but then Thomas means he's talking about the deus, he's not talking about God. And he doesn't say God exists. He said God, he uses exists there in one of the two medieval meanings. And what it means is not that there is something outside the universe called God, or that God's wandering around at night when you're not looking. He doesn't mean that. He means that all of the real is God. That's what Deus means. All reality. And the other thing about this word exists in the medieval sense, not the modern sense, is it means, it means uh, non-dependent actualization. So it's actualization. Actualization Tate isn't bad. It's in German. I can't do it in all languages. Um, but the key point is non-dependent. That's what Aquinas really means by this divine stuff. You don't need other reality to make it happen. It's non dependent Now, one last thing, and I'm always willing to go home. All of this uh, also relates to the next book, uh, Adrian's going to write. I don't think he started it yet, but he will have to write it. Because it all relates to German idealism and German romanticism. Because I am saying that German idealism and German romanticism are the most important developments in philosophy since ancient times, and we need to understand them. It's not easy because there are no books on them in, a, in English that are really okay. There are two and a half. Uh, and a couple. Of course, there are translations from German books, but the American stuff and the English stuff is basically all hopeless because they can't understand each other or fit it to a head. And the degree of error is unimaginable. The new Cambridge translation of the logic by a very outstanding American Hegel scholar is wrong in every single word. He thinks that Geist is about reason. I mean, that's just catastrophically stupid. Uh, Hegel, of course, is patristic Greek. But he doesn't know to just agree. All right, so we, we do need German idealism, we do need romanticism. What do we need from them is the philosophy of freedom. We need a philosophy of freedom that grounds our liberalism, taking up that thing, in our metaphysics, which is what John Milbank has been asking. So if Milbank was here, you see, my argument is yes, you're right, John, but you've got it upside down. John thinks liberalism is disastrous. We have, should have instead of metaphysics and ground our practice in the metaphysics. Yes, I like all of that, but it's the other way around. Liberalism is not disastrous, but it does need to be metaphysically grounded, and that undermines the whole modern liberal tradition. But it doesn't, it doesn't foreclose our future. And what I mean by metaphysically grounded is not what Americans mean, because metaphysical in America uh, is a vague word. After all, the metaphysical bookstores, and it means occult. But in serious discourse, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean there are things other than the things that exist either. It means that there are necessary conditions of the possibility of entities, and that giving that transcendental account is part of understanding how universes of manifestation necessarily work. So that's what I mean by this. Now, put all this together, we get nothing practical and nothing clear, but we get, I think, a story that does have some uh, bite in terms of the necessity of keeping the political theological space for soft discourse going to where we can't go with the hard sciences, or with the mathematics and the logic. We also get away, I think, of bringing all the spiritual traditions in the world into a kind of ecumenical dialogue. That's already happening. But this ups it, because instead of them exchanging ridiculous discussions about doctrines or texts, we get to the point of saying to them, what new organizational forms can you develop now? What new forms of recognition can you propose now? The Buddhists are very good at that. I've been working with them for about 30 years, and they're very on the ground. 
They can do this, they can produce new recognition, they can produce new organizational forms. Remember, they invented capitalism, so it was them, not people in the West. Uh, the Muslims are less good at it. Uh, they are sympathetic, they talk about Islamic banking, but the self-worship principle applies, and they're not very good at developing forms of it for non-Muslim peoples. The Kafir doesn't get a lot of organizational help in Pakistan. Uh, so there is some of right, and maybe a last bit of right, and this is just to end, but also to warn you there's more to come. Uh, all everything I'm saying is a kind of rewrite of the late lectures of Schelling. The most important lecture of the 19th century are Schelling's late Berlin lectures. They've never been properly translated. Some of it is brilliantly translated by Bruce Matthews of New York. His work is wonderful. I can't find anything negative to say. I couldn't do a millionth of what he's achieved. It's wonderful, but he didn't do the hard bits. Uh, Peter Osborne in England is now doing the hard bits, and we're 12 months, we should have it. This is the most difficult stuff in the 19th century. It's not, you can't solve this problem by opening the text and reading it. No, no, no. It's extremely difficult because Schelling knows all the science of the 19th century. He's a mathematical genius too, and he's also got about 18 languages, especially Arabic, and in helpful moments in the same sentence, he refers to the math and the Arabic. All right, but the relevance of Schelling is this. that Schelling saw that we could not go forward if we did not have a philosophy of temporal becoming that was able to deal with the actual concrete reality of positive history. That's Schelling's insight. He picks up, if you like, intuitive cognition in Scotus, because Scotus already saw that you must be able to give an account of singers. That's why Hopkins said it. It isn't enough to talk about roses. You'll have to talk about this rose. It won't do to talk about girls. You have to talk about that girl. And once you get that point, you see we do need to address the creation of positive philosophy. I don't say that Schelling got the detail of it right, quite the opposite. But the project of a positive philosophy after the negative philosophy is part of the way forward. Put it all together, I think I can say the following. We could have a positive utopian political theology if we could show, as our claim, but not shown, that it has direct practical consequences for the reform of real institutions on the ground. That's only if I can show the latter that you need to take all this seriously, because otherwise you can say, well, fireworks it may be, but uh, I'm interested in the real world. But I'm interested in the world too. And because of my, as I said last night, because I was trained as a lawyer, uh, I've had a lot of experience with dealing with people in politics and governance studies. And one of the things you learn eventually is that they can't fix anything. Their <coughs> practicism doesn't do it. And that's partly because they can't see that Spiritual beings like ourselves need to exercise our spirituality in the organizational form. Not in the mythological heaven and not in the mythological church, but in the actual organizational form. Now, if you understand that sentence, the person who understood it, of course, was Fichte, and after him, Hegel. If you understand that sentence, then you see that every major institution of the West can be reformed, can be given evocative restructuring. Now, if that's so, we have something to say back to China. We can say, yes, you're doing brilliantly. Yes, we love you. Yes, there's enormous social progress in your country, but you don't have a single vocative institution. And America has a genius for the vocative. Underdeveloped, often ignored, I didn't say with usually nothing, often despised by highbrow university professors. Don't despise them. It's the great charism of this country. And if you translate it into concrete organizational forms, you'll not only defeat the Chinese, you'll be the most important country in the world. So yes, let's make America. Great right. <laughs> <laughs>conferences over promise and under deliver I hope this was the opposite <laughs> in terms of getting us started but over to you for questions comments maybe some objections as well as you as you heard you know Wayne you know wants to have that that dialogue it's all about uh, you know generally a critical theory of you know where we are not not repeating uh, you know cliches and conventional categories you had the hand up George yes was yeah, Master David, and then we'll do a second round. Oh, oh, please. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But I do have a problem with turning the talk in. Uh, what I got from your presentation is a realist theology. theology. But not a utopian. Utopian is a little bit too abstract, mm. in my view. Mm. I've got an essay on that, and I've had trouble with it exactly. You're on the money. 
because I'd like to get rid of the word utopia, but every time I cross it out I put another word in, then I have the problem that people don't get the point. Because I'm not obviously defending utopia in the sense of Thomas More, I'm not defending perfect society stuff, I'm not using utopia in the way the 20th century intellectuals did as meaning the sublime. Because what I mean by utopia is nothing to do with that. I mean the atopical, which is crucial to releasing you from the manifest. Now there are books and articles on this, I'm not the only person saying this, the young Russian, you might see us know, giving lectures in theology in Berlin along these lines. It's a way of rereading German ideas. It's partly connected to Alberti, you know art, Alberti's theory of perspective. Alberti comes along with theory of perspective and suddenly real buildings are built incarnating that theory of perspective. And so the void at the heart of the theory of perspective becomes the basis of a new organization of the world. So utopia here means atopical as something that can be translated into real new organizational reality. So it's not to stay in the cloud, it's not sublime, it's not uh, quasi-mystical, it's a new organizational form theory. And that should be a bit of your awareness to help. Not all of it, some of you. Oscar. Um, do you, uh, yeah, first of all, two comments and then a question. First of all, thank you very much for mentioning Schelling, because as we were talking about romanticism, I can tell you, hey, I think we should change. Uh, and there you were. Also, our perspective, let's not forget Nicholas Pisa as a critical critique of that. Okay, comment number one, and then my question. Um, I lost comment number one. Oh, yeah. I was very glad that in, in the beginning, when it, you said you needed a new enlightenment um, and so on for the future, um, that you did get round. Uh, I was concerned that you were then ignoring all past notions of what you were calling enlightenment, including indigenous and and um, and so on. That there was nothing from the past that you could be used for the future. And I was very glad just to comment that you got round to including indigenous and other something I said. <laughs> no. I think I think the you no know, the other way there. Yeah. Um, uh, because I think there's a great deal from uh, indigenous and early, many early um, philosophies, if you will, that shorthand, that in engage um, nature, our place in it, cosmos transcendent, that would be applicable and that we have suppressed or ignored or um, rejected it. Um, so suggestion on that, um, you may know Ilya Delio, the Franciscan sister and physicist who tries to unite some core Christian uh, concepts for the future of artificial intelligence and so on. That's comment number one. So comment number two, you know you baited me, so I'm going to take the bait, um, about uh, uh, Jewish uh, theology getting the critique of idolatry right, but not noticing that group worship is a form of idolatry. So that's the strain of Jewish theology, and not only the strain. And of course, you mentioned, or, or almost mentioned, or baited me by not mentioning Maimonides, along with Aquinas. There's a long tradition preceding Maimonides and, and following from Maimonides that um, uh, under, understands a completely different engagement between group, humanity, cosmos, transcendent, that is not particularist. And I know this because when I write about it, Half the people boo down, right? That's the particular so who don't get it, right? I mean, they don't, if it, half the people get it uh, because there's a great deal of Jewish work done on it. And half the people so badly don't get it that um, they, um, they reject it without knowing they didn't get the concept. So um, both are there, but we should take a look at all the work in Jewish philosophy that does have this engagement. Question is, so tell us more if you would, about this wonderful, uh, I agree with you, but I'd like to hear more from you about the um, vocative American tradition that used to be in every town. This is Tocqueville, and he was right about it, um, that we, you think we could use now, because I do agree with you. I think we are on the verge of forgetting whatever that was. I'd like to hear more from you on that. I agree with all the comments. Uh, Nita Zakuza is crucial in all the ways she suggests, but uh, Johannes Hoff, if you know his great book, yes. um, has unfortunately left uh, London and is now living in a castle in Austria, uh, so we won't have another great book for about two years, as one of my students is writing that great book. Uh, and the second issue you raise, I'm of course a follower of Maimonides. So not only are we not in conflict, but Maimonides is one of my absolute all-time heroes, uh, for all the reasons you realize, and because he does what I love. He distinguishes domains. 
and understands that in this domain, you will be very hard. In that domain, you will be very kind. He doesn't have this useless, generic thinking. He understands the real texture of our life. So I'm on, we agree totally. The vocative American tradition, I think you should ask an American to do that, but I, I would just say oh, a, well, a couple of things. No, I haven't left. No, I haven't left. But I mean, it's a big ask for a little person from the desert at the bottom of the world. Um, I think it's the first thing that strikes the foreigner when they come to the United States for the first time. You go into a shop and somebody says, Good morning. And, or you go into a hotel and someone says, have a nice day. And it, it irritates you. <laughs> but then you notice that this doesn't happen in the same way in other countries. And then you look at the greatest minds America ever had. And there is something they have in common, whether it's Emerson or Jonathan Edwards or Dewey. They all have this feeling that in ordinary life, great mysteries are present without pretension, and without doctrine, and without hierarchy. Now that is very extraordinary as well. I don't think I can name another country that feels that as deeply. It is very deep in this country. And it's deep in the black church, and I, I feel that every time I come, I get off the plane and I get very angry with you, particularly when I go to the hotels, which are normally knocked down, or I, get, you know, I encounter some of the mess in the streets and so on. And then I start noticing how I'm being treated. And then you see again the American knowledge. So I think it's part of what Eugene was trying to say last night, that we can get so sold on either attacking the, the bourgeois left or agreeing with them, that we forget that the real force in this country is in the ordinary people. It's not in the bourgeois left. That's, I can't do better, I apologize. I can perhaps give one last sentence because I've written a lot on Joseph Smith and the Mormons. So this is one point when I come into the American story. Because again, I looked at them and I thought, this is the greatest madness I've ever seen. And I read it and I went to Salt Lake and I talked to a lot of Mormon women. And I came away convinced that the Mormons have a charisma. And it's in the women. Unfortunately, you've talked to the men. You mustn't talk to the men. But the women, yes. And what is it? It's, it's again, it's something to do with this American thing. It's a way of finding the spiritual in very simple one-to-one -one interaction. And I would say I've met more saints among Mormon women than probably in any other community in the world. And I won't comment on Mormon men, but the men are, it's not as obvious as the men, but it's very striking in the men. David. Um, so, Mark already answered the question I had about giving us some examples that we can talk about. <laughs> and if you've done that, that's, that's fine. And, and uh, the, I guess, I'm back to the first question I had, which was, um, why do you want to call it enlightenment then if it's not? If it's not the old, if it's not the 18th century enlightenment, and it's about this sort of utopian thing uh, that seems to be, I mean, it sounds to me, I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that this utopian aspect is you're, uh, you're modulating to sort of Thomas More utopia so that it actually um, fits with this idea of the American bucket. Because I think you're seeing the sort of utopian moment in the in this American world. That's how I'm reading it, that, that there's this sort of this moment of possible spirituality in every yes. single interaction, it says. Yes. Um, and that seems to be much more along the lines of, of Haman rather than Kant, right? In the sense that Haman is really talking about precisely that type of, um, what? Uh, uh, every, every moment really is a revelation, right? Or a, there's a, there's a, yes, yeah, I mean, he's, 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 he's thinking of some human sense, right? I, I, but, but, but that, I guess maybe, maybe you want to draw the hum out of that to make it enlightened, but, but for me, Haman is really the anti like the figure to come. Well, I don't draw anything from Haman, but I do draw that, I don't take it from him, but I do agree with what you say about that. But of course, he doesn't say it by any accident, he's a Christian preacher. And this is foundational Christian doctrine. It's very foundational Christian doctrine. I mean, Christianity is always held that the full revelation is in the moment and in the actual practical life of persons. It's always been about that. And if that's false, then nothing will save the Christians. Yes, and Harman has it because he's Christian, not because he's Harman. It isn't in Kant, but Kant isn't Christian. Right, that's the why. Why is it enlightenment that you're talking about? Oh, well, back to the enlightenment. That's the question. Okay, right. I can answer that very, very straightforwardly. You see, you do, as, as many people do, do what I want to reject 
See, many people, such as Israel, uh, or Peter Gay, the dear old Peter Gay, who I nearly studied with at Princeton, I'm glad I didn't, but I nearly did. Uh, these people, or as I Berlin, who I knew very well, these people all think enlightenment's about ideas. But see, I don't buy one word of that, because I think that's nonsense. And I think it's a wrong history of the Enlightenment. I, I can argue that for the next four days, but in very simple terms, the Enlightenment's almost all Christian. Even in France, the only people who buy the pamphlets are the Christian clergy, because no one else can afford them. Look at the price. There are books on that. The Enlightenment's Christian. So I'm not interested in the ideas about it, because they are of their time. Some good, some bad. They passed away. We don't bring them back. By Enlightenment, I don't mean ideas either one or the other. I mean actual organizational forms, and I mean the two central principles are, one, emerge from self-imposed tutelage. Kant, and I can write about that. I think we are still pre-adult persons who are living with self-imposed tutelage, so that's the first commitment <coughs> to the Enlightenment. Get on with the job and finish it. And the second one is apply reason to everything. And that's as enlightenment as you could possibly be. Where I differ from the 18th century is I want to apply reason to the whole of evolutionary spirituality. And so I won't agree with the enlightenment about religion at all. Because if you ask any enlightenment figure, well, can you give me now your account of the spirituality of the elephant? You won't get anything. And if you talk about even smaller things, you get nothing at all. Uh, and of course, if you, once you move to other planets and other levels of being, you get nothing because they didn't know there were any such things. They're living in a funny little, almost Roman, self-enclosed sense of world. So I'm, I'm ad advocating enlightenment in the sense of emergence of self-imposed tutelage and the application of reason to everything. I don't say, of course, that reason will be enough. That's the whole point of my presentation. I absolutely don't say that. So it's rationalistic, but it's not rationalist in the 19th century sense, no. It doesn't come from any Enlightenment thinker, though I, like, I admit to liking almost all of them. I even say kind things, except in America, about Kant. And to get in China, I have to say lots of kind things because they haven't got it yet. You know, you need to get a manual. When you've got it, you need to shake it off a bit and read my Hegel. But if that covers that a bit. So I don't think we're in conflict, but that's what I mean by Enlightenment. I will, I will um, take uh, at least another round of three, but can I just abuse my, my yes. position of chair and ask you, because you kind of, in a, in a throwaway remark, uh, and they're always the ones that I think um, sort of, you know, uh, might hide a really important point, you kind of said something about the Renaissance and how we sort of get away. From the historical Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, so similar to, to, you know, the questions that have been asked, I suppose my, my question would be, well, of course, we can see a lot that's wrong in the world, you know, man is a measurable thing, I and mean, all sorts, you know, kind of form of anthropocentrism yeah. that, that, of course, is incredibly dangerous. But, then, but surely, you know, figures like Nature's of Pisa very yes, early yes, on, and yes. lots of others, Pico, yeah. Pico exactly, yeah. would yeah. suggest that there's something in the Renaissance that's also absolutely vital. So the pain. same answer to Adrian I gave to David, that is to say, I'm not against the Renaissance in the sense of ideas, yeah. but what I'm worried about is particular conception of historical method, that's the only point. And the problem about it is, you see, as you know, they have learned the ancient languages and they promoted the studies of text. And it made tremendous progress possible for the whole of Europe. So cheer and cheer and cheer. But there comes a moment when we have to get over it. Because we have to ultimately understand that you can't do history if you use texts. That you've got to study context and you've got to look at scientific and other evidence that's not in the text. Now, I can talk about this for days, so I won't waste your time, but a simple example everyone will understand is that the history of Japan, as written by foreigners, was based on translating great Japanese texts, and the China the same. And in both cases, the result is basically fiction, because you have to see these texts as produced by political context for actors for particular reasons. And then you have to say, well, what actually happened? And you can't answer that by quoting Chinese classics or Japanese classics or Korean classics. They're relevant, absolutely, but they're not sufficient. Because what you've got to do is ask, well, what does the archaeology show? What it shows the history of China doesn't correspond with the history of Chinese kids learned in school. They weren't on the Wei River. It wasn't Zhong War. And if you take Japan, the Japanese history is about one island. The rest of it's left out. And the actual history of Japan is not reflected uh, in the national story significantly. And we know from genetics that Indonesians are the same as Japanese. And that's not possible either in the Indonesian history or in the Japanese history. Mm -hmm. So we see there's something wrong with that conceptual history. That's all I meant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, more questions to Wayne. Um, there's so much that, I, that, that it gives me to uh, uh, reflect on. I guess it's one thing that uh, pops into my head is that it seems that um, we're at a point where maybe the, that um, what was formerly radical is actually now becoming uh, you know, conceivable. 
I'm thinking in the realm of economics, yes, for example, yes, the yes, idea yes. of like a, a debt jubilee, yes, yes, right, which might actually yes. confront us with, with yes. for example, the fictional nature of money. Yes. Um, and um, and I like to, um, in particular, your your uh, preference for institutions over ideas. But then I'm wondering what you would make of, um, say, like um, later critiques uh, from, uh, say, Nietzsche and Heidegger, right? That the problem of the modern is that we are somehow incapable of reforming or or making our, uh, remaking our institutions, right? That that there's something. Um, uh, something that is broken down, um, I guess both regard would call it the symbolic, you know, at the level of symbolic, that, that prevents us from, you know, from uh, moving forward and doing, it seems, what every other people in history were somehow able to do, right? So, I mean, you know, like sometimes I, I wonder, like, um, I mean, if we were Republican Romans, we would have no problems about solving global warming. Yes, I mean, I mean we'd be very cruel, I think, yeah. in, in other respects, but yeah, I mean, yeah. we should be able to get the job done. Um, I agree with all of that. I, I... I agree. I wouldn't go to Nietzsche, I think. Uh, I know quite a lot about Nietzsche, and I can talk if you like about the new Nietzsche, which is not the new Nietzsche in the paperbacks, but which really goes into his Lutheran background and shows that his classical philology is the key to it, and that it is a new kind of theology. People quote the ridiculous line, God is dead, forgetting that that's what the man says. And Nietzsche, of course, did nothing if not wonderful. That's weird. Uh, I, I, I agree with what you say, but I think we are guilty of not applying our science to the reformed institutions. And our social sciences aren't much help because they're not scientific, and the people who become professors of them aren't reading the science. People who read the science are a great deal better, not because they're reading the science only, but because they get oriented towards modes of inquiry that lead to satisfactory outcomes. Whereas if you learn at university to talk mega talk, as to some extent I did, I was a close friend of people know, I think, of Gillian Rose. And Gillian and I uh, were probably the best mega talkers of the period. <laughs> uh, we were unintelligible, you couldn't beat us in an argument because we threw in so many unbelievably highbrow words, you, you wouldn't get up. But there's no outcome from that, you see. Whereas if you read the actual sciences, you get into the habit, A, of not being so dogmatic, because science is constantly fracturing our illusions, and B, you get the proper point. But false ability is really a big thing, it's not a little thing. Uh, so that's my advice on that. But I agree with you about the symbolic, and I, I, I think I haven't thought deeply enough about it. Thank you. Other questions? Um, okay. Thanks. So I'm also interested in organizational structures and the symbolic, particularly the turn towards the internet. When you imagine a reform of institutions, do you see it happening on the physical level, or could this be something that played out in cyberspace? I think that the literature, you know, this the best literature on all of this is late Amer American late 19th century, when American theosophists, who are completely crazy obviously, uh, realized what isn't crazy that the development of the machine would abolish the human being altogether. And this is clear in the 1870s and 1880s. Ladovatsky takes it up in England, Steiner takes it up in Germany, and we didn't get it. Because these people were mad, we didn't listen. But they weren't mad about this. In other words, there is a Goethe, a Faustian thing, where we create the technology, we don't see it's going to get rid of us. Well, we should now see it's going to get rid of us. And that means we have to really take it on board in the ways you're suggesting, but much more so, because we have to ask ourselves, how do you plan scientifically cognitive formation of youth so that the concepts stay in the right place or go to the right place and don't go where the machines take? And how do you organize your institutions so that your young people don't become like young people who are in the West now, basically living in this virtual cyberspace, which has the second effect, and again, People don't recognize it, mental illness. Don't know what the American story is, but in Australia, one in four young people are mentally ill. And 60% uh, of our governmental people are mentally ill. <laughs> and as you know from it, lawyers and, uh, lawyers and solicitors are prominent for suicide. They kill themselves. Is that 60 or 16? 60. No, it's very large. Yeah. Uh, I mean people running it. I don't mean the poor person behind the desk, but I know quite a lot of these people. They get, they're given a whole government department. The government changes the policy every two days. They do all the stats on something, and then they ring up and say, well, we can't have these statistics. Change all the numbers. <laughs> and these are people, these are good, intelligent people, and they can do it once, they can do it twice. The third time, and something goes wrong, and they go on leave, and they take various sedatives. <laughs> 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 
Right, so one I think we've one. got yeah one last one, and uh, and we are going to break for coffee, but obviously the conversation will continue. And there's a question of utopia in in Adorno's negative dialect. Yes, yeah. The next utopia with the Wunderfeld book. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The critique of ideology. Yes. Yeah. The problem with the with thinking of utopian when it becomes a positive thing, producing yeah. more systems of domination. Yes. Um, so how does that you know how would that type of critique of utopia play into what you're talking about? You you know thinking through the utopian concept to produce new in some sense, historically bound yes. positive institutions. Well, I'm extremely interested in all of that for all the reasons you correctly give, because it's a very interesting literature, but it's, it's been a total organizational failure. No country in the world has used the Dorno to solve any problem about anything. Right. Nobody reads the Dorno anymore, <laughs> and young Germans can't read it. If you've ever had to read a Dorno as German, you'll know it's pretty stiff, and young Germans don't know those words. Uh, the point really is that it is uh, you're completely right, build it for uh, In other words, it's the, the ban on images in the Jewish tradition which he takes to exclude a positive concept of utopia. And in the famous interview, which you obviously know with Bloch, they argued about this. Well, I'm the world authority on Bloch, so for obvious reasons I'm sympathetic to the other side. But the point really is much simpler and humbler. That he's discussing, you know, inverse theology, negative dialectics, uh, the other theology, brilliant, brilliant ideas, in really unbelievably wonderful text. But he's never in his life, except for the work on the radio, I give him that, comes down on the radio and I think gets a bit, he's never really proposing a different way of organizing the membership. <coughs> There's nothing like that, anything like that in Adorno. He's too high in social status, he doesn't go to the shop. But he has no model for doing that. And so I think the attack on positive utopia, while it's okay at the level of Heidegger at all, doesn't veto the point that concrete organizational forms can be developed with real utopian features. I'll give you three and I'll shut up, but they're quite devastating. Uh, at one point in the history of the world, we invented the white flag. Before that, Armies left their dead on the battlefield. Now, oh, there's a concrete utopian example. It's extremely concrete. It's not politically dangerous. It doesn't involve delusions of grandeur. It's very concrete. But it transforms the way human animals organize their lives because suddenly there's an institutional organizational reality of a concrete kind that changes the field. A second example uh, would probably be the Red Cross. Or if you don't like that, the voting. The ballot box, simple, not complex, concrete, utopian, very, very simple, changes everything. I mean, imagine if there was a free election in China and people were asked if they liked President Xi and if they agreed with his brilliant plans. It would change China every night. They would be there for half an hour. There's never been any support for the Communist Party in China, as opposed to China's national greatness, which has total support. Of course, it's in other countries. And the third example, and this is for America, because uh, we have in Australia, with many, many things wrong, but we have some wonderful examples of this, and we have compulsory voting. Now, this is as simple as you could ever get. We have compulsory voting. What does it mean? You never get any of the rubbish you had in America. You don't get Trump, you don't get any of them on either side. Because no political party can ignore the poor. No political party can ignore the people who don't like them. Because you won't win the election. So both sides are forced to address the common good and to try to bring over large social groups who basically hate them. So it's as simple as compulsory voting. And if you abolish it, and some groups in Australia want to abolish it, well, then you get the American mess in our country. So don't underestimate these tiny things. That's what I'm after. I'm not after, you know, Niagara Falls. I'm after the washing machine, another good example, the washing machine. And this changed the lives of women throughout the entire world. Instead of spending half the day banging those clothes, you, you, you can actually go and do something or, or you know, take the children for a walk or even have a job. So these small things are of revolutionary world historical significance. But you've got to go with this lady to the organisation form. You've got to go to positive utopia, not negative utopia. And you've kind of got to be interested in scientifically testable results, not in highbrow megatons. I say that as someone who spent half my life doing high profile. But I think I was wrong. Uh, and another, if you want another example, look at citizenship and refugees, we can talk about it all day, but it goes round and round and round because we don't have the simple, concrete, organizational form that we solve. <clears throat> 
So, I think there's plenty there, not just for the coffee break, but for the rest of the conference. So, uh, let's uh, enjoy that coffee and the conversation outside. Before that, please join me in thanking Wayne.